Well, thank you for having us. I'm uh, Rich Edwards, and this is Steve Schuler. We're going to split our presentation in half. I'll do the first half and then kick it over to Steve. Um, we're very excited to be here, but we're not high altitude balloon specialists. Uh, the way we have found out about this conference and come into this area is we have subject matter experts at Ball State, especially Dr. Melissa Mitchell, who actually use high altitude balloons to create an undergraduate curriculum to support the next generation of middle school teachers. This effort's been working in conjunction over several years, at least three years, with Taylor University and their efforts led by uh, Don Takahara and Hank Voss. So at a certain point uh, last year, I had never even heard of the word high altitude, uh, the phrase high altitude ballooning. But Melissa Mitchell came to our unit, and we're the unit at Ball State which involves the creation of online and blended media uh, for learning. And so when Melissa wanted to work on the wider dissemination of the work that she had been doing for three years, she came to our unit and said, what can I learn maybe do to help us to take all this robust material we've built over the last few years and get it out to other colleges that might be interested in supporting pre-service or in-service training on the HAB curriculum, or what type of materials could we have for uh, middle schools. Towards that end, my team, led by Steve Schuler, put together two proof of concept projects. One was a website called Teaching on the Edge, which I guess can become an acronym called TOTE, T-O-T-E, uh, and be able to tote our HAB curriculums around. Um, and we also wanted to create a proof of concept for an iBook. And so we also created a um, interactive book specifically geared towards sixth to eighth grade middle school students because we really wanted that to be the element that really starts to attract and uh, grab the attention of um, the learners. And I guess that's the important part that's going to be if we reduced what Steve and I are going to be talking about over the next um, 17 minutes or so, we're really talking about how we take all of this brilliant, great knowledge in this auditorium and package it in certain ways so that overworked middle school teachers can easily and readily have access to the resources to teach these materials. How to support and train the next set of undergraduate in-service teachers so that they're prepared from day one when they walk on the job to be able to work with the high altitude balloon curriculum. So our efforts, the ones that we were doing at iLearn, are all about packaging this material so that we can broaden participation and get science teachers and middle school science learners in the tent actually doing this work. And that's surprisingly difficult to do because we can't just give them all of our great, brilliant technical data and all the information on the launches. This has to come in packages that are understandable to a seventh grade science teacher. What is the curriculum? What are the lessons I'm actually assigning my students at 10 a.m. in the morning? How precisely can I do other supplemental experiments in my classroom that will build on the insights of this type of project-based, hands-on STEM learning. Towards that end, everything that we put together was trying to do four things that we think starts to advance the teaching and learning of the HAB curriculum. The first, which I've heard all throughout this conference, and it's absolutely wonderful, is everything we tend to do should be around open source and open educational resources. We need to share freely and share widely if we're going to continue to add people to our movement. Um, based on my day job, where I'm the executive director of a unit with primary responsibilities over online education, 
I frequently look at what you guys are doing and say, let's get more of this stuff online as online courses, as online materials. And I've heard brilliant, fabulous stuff. Ethan's stuff on the online ballooning portal, we should try to make a connection there. When I was hearing Matthew talking about the best practices that you might put up at the SBA website, that's another point of connection. But all of that in terms of having resources accessible online still requires the next step of faculty development and curricular materials. Also, of you know, a lot of you might not be as um, into the weeds around learning theories for the 21st century, but one of the hot catchphrases is all around blended learning, around where you have these moments that you know, do all sorts of different metamorphoses around the classroom experience. And for me, high altitude ballooning is a brilliant uh, blended learning moment. It is field-based exercises. It could be online data and so forth, but it can also be this sensational moment of in the classroom um, engagement and conversation. And then in terms of our iPad initiative, we also wanted to look at mobile learning. I really can imagine a time, even by 2017, when we're looking at the solar eclipse stuff, that you'd really want your students in the field with mobile technologies, whether it's the next generation of cell phones, next generation of tablets. This is a field ripe because you're actually out in the elements launching balloons. To have your computing resources uh, with you and to design teaching and learning materials that are intentionally mobile because that's where the high altitude blonde launches are at. You want the learners, even theoretically as you're on a chase for a balloon, why shouldn't they be on their own technologies, mobile, wirelessly, doing the science that they can benefit and learn from? We had four project goals, very straightforward. We wanted to work to see if we can improve the teaching tools for the HAB curriculum. We wanted to help develop and share the uh, HAB uh, curriculum. One of the things that Dr. Melissa Mitchell did at Ball State is she has had undergraduate students for the last three years create online, um, um, create classroom resources and all of those are now available at the Teaching on the Edge website so that a teacher can actually pull together materials that can turn into lesson plans, teaching mod modules, and um, in cl uh, classroom exercises. We saw all of this as knowledge sharing, and so our interest in online was mostly around mobile and sharing, and then K-12 resources. We wanted this to, in many ways, create a critical mass, or at least the beginnings of a uh, demonstration of what might create um, some tipping points around um, materials that could get broader adoption, because we always understood our mission as trying to get more middle schools to adopt this curriculum. The part that you'll probably, uh, that I find very interesting myself is one of the ways to broaden the tent with any of you who are more connected with an academic institution is to consider which experts on your campus you might be able to tap into to continue to build your own materials the way Steve and I built ours. So mostly what I have been hearing so far in the room is the subject matter expertise, which is absolutely essential and step one. But if your campus has instructional designers, media development specialists, online education specialists, or learning technologists, those are resources of, of individuals and skills and talents that naturally package the insights and the materials you guys have for broader dissemination. So in many ways, when Steve and I were tapped, we came in at this level here, two through five, and just worked with subject matter experts like uh, Don and Melissa, but ultimately our expertise was in the repackaging and the uh, dissemination of these materials. So with that, I'll kick it over to Steve to talk a little bit about a project we did previously that we feel is related to high altitude balloons. Thanks, Rich. Um, one of the projects that Ball State worked on years ago, uh, and what I was lucky enough to be part of, years uh, that actually disbanded in 2008 or 2009, around that timeline, 
We worked with the electronic field trip. Some of you may have heard of this. These are basically geared, for, uh, are geared towards K through 12 students. Uh, a lot of engagement and scientific um, uh, different subjects. Uh, used a lot of games, a lot of interactivity, a lot of web-based materials, a lot of video and stuff like that. So that was kind of the expertise that I came from and decided to put the spin on this particular project so we could also distribute something very similar. So with that uh, history behind us and also a couple of the people that worked on this project um, also was uh, part of this as well. Uh, one of the interesting parts of, of working with this project and how it evolved uh, we also had a series of students at Ball State that worked on these projects, the electron field trips, which evolved into what we call the digital core. And the digital core are students who are media specialists who can design websites, video, and so forth like that. So first thing we did is we had the materials that Dr. Mitchell had provided to us, and we needed to put those into a package. And the easiest and most logical approach was to design a website. So what we did is we took our subject matter experts, they compiled all the data, and we put it into a resources center. We also, at that time, determined what kind of style and what kind of design we were going to use for the website, and what elements of interactivity we wanted to add to the website. And then finally, uh, the timeline was extremely uh, tight. We came in, as Rich said, we came into this last year at the end of the life cycle of grant. So we had a very small and condensed timeline we had to work with. Luckily, we didn't have to ramp up technology-wise because we already had those experts in place. And we, and we really, as soon as we got the subject matter, we were ready to hit the ground running. So the first thing we did is videos. We shot videos. Kind of let this go. In meteorology, we use weather balloons to study the atmosphere. You're out in the real world laboratories. They showed me how to um, actually get the helium, get the equipment for the balloons. All these things are clearly changing, and we're clearly getting some results on our experiment. They drew conclusions based on those real life events. Showing the, the launch during flight, so you'll be able to experience near space conditions. Just having that memorable experience of trying to investigate something, trying to research something on their own, and then you remember this particular day. So one of the things that was interesting is we were actually working with two different audiences for this. One, we were working for uh, developing curriculum for in-service teachers, basically people that were going to be science teachers in sixth through eighth grade, middle school, uh, predominantly. So we had to cater, so most of the website is actually catered towards that audience, because that's where you actually get the materials for the classroom and so forth, and you can get information on high altitude ballooning and, and some of the resources that um, uh, a lot of you are familiar with. Our second audience what were the children, the actual students that were going to be learning this in the classroom. So we tried to make everything very kid-friendly. But we didn't want to talk down to kids at the same time. We wanted to make it very interactive, and we wanted them to learn. Uh, I have a great, uh, I have a 10-year-old at home, and I said the best uh, time I have teaching him is when he doesn't know that I'm actually teaching him anything. And so we kind of disguise it. We, we, we give it with a spoonful of sugar, if you will, and uh, I kind of went with that route. Um, one of the things we also did on the website that was very interesting is, is we, as we collected all this data, and we're talking raw data that was taken from the, uh, the, the actual launches themselves, a lot of it you're familiar with, the ge uh, geolocation data, altitude, so forth like that. We created an actual simulator that took all of that data and extracted what we need and created a simulator based upon open tools, which is Google Maps and so forth like this and some of the weather uh, information. And it would actually show in, in real time the tracking. Well, we'd actually speed it up because you don't have time for watch two hours of a dot going across. So we'd speed it up. But one of the things you could actually track which direction the balloon was going, as well as any kind of um, uh, its, its altitude and so forth. And, and the little icon actually, when it gets to a certain, it actually bursts. Uh, a, a parachute deploys, and you can run through that and, scr and scrub through the actual timeline. Well, one interesting thing I want to say about this is we did get raw data, and one of the balloon launches was picture perfect. Uh, the data was there, it was great, we had to strip out the hour that it sat on the ground before the launch, but once we figured that out, uh, we had a very clear launch. Now the second one we had a problem with, and we were launching it, and all of a sudden it would jump about 500 miles off course. So I'm thinking either it got attacked by a 747 or there was an error in the data. 
Well, the latter was the case. And what happened was the, there was actually a, a, an error in the, the, the GPS location. So we had to kind of actually fill in the gaps based upon what we knew of where it was going and also with the subject matter X where she had to help us with kind of filling in the gaps of where that data was actually corrupted. So that was interesting part of it as well because you gotta imagine I'm dealing with um, college students are building this for me and I always say whatever you give them they're going to give you right back. So they gave this to me and they're like I I'm not an expert, but something doesn't look right on this. And the dots would just jump all over the place. So once we figured that out, actually a student did discover that. Now, this was an interesting concept and a novel, a new concept that we did with uh, um, not only our organization, we had been doing some research on iBooks, but not really actively pursuing them. So this was kind of our first uh, full um, uh, diving into iBooks. So it was interesting in that, but we also, again, wanted to make it very kid-friendly. This was kind of inspired from a conference that I came back from right before we took this grant, where they were doing uh, studies on fish hatcheries. <laughs> and what they were doing was taking iPads out into the fish hatcheries. Of course, they had all these you know, watertight uh, cases for them and stuff. But they were doing a lot of their field work and taking it with them with iPads. So I had this novel idea, well, what's you don't really do these launches inside, you do them outside. So it'd be nice to kind of take this idea of a flipped or a blended class and you learn some of the history of, of ballooning and, and some of the other activities. And there are some also some um, activities that kids can do and follow along with the videos and with the iBook and do experiments at home or in the classroom. Um, again, being a father of a 10 year old child, I know the, the, the problems that we have in the classrooms today is it's just time. It's time and being able to get the information out to somebody and have them it really a lot of times we're just pushing information and testing on the results. Well, this was kind of a case, the kids want to use this. My son and his buddies were all using this. They were my first testers and they thought it was awesome and they're playing with it. And I'm like, if these kids who are by far the most critical of critics you can possibly have on something like this, enjoy, we're actually doing something right. So. Um, I'm going to flip over very quickly and just give you an idea of the, the iBook here. And this is on the, uh, the, the, the actual, uh, not on an iPad, obviously. Um, but you can download this for free. And I'll give you guys the uh, address here at, at, the, at the end of the presentation. But essentially, this is a, uh, a book that it's, it's a little wonky with a mouse. It's not so much touch like an iBook. But it goes over some history of ballooning. Uh, again, this is all stuff you guys know about. Um, these on the iBook, if you actually uh, touch these uh, on the iPad, they actually uh, move and, and actually react. Um, some of the other aspects that we can do of early ballooning history. But we basically went through ballooning history and then had some interactive aspects as part of it as well. And I'm just flipping through very quickly. Uh, but there are also some uh, little assessments to kind of see what you remembered uh, through there. Uh, it doesn't save any of that information, but it was just a way for kids to kind of get in, uh, a little bit uh, in, involved in a little bit more of what they're learning. Um, and then uh, we had through, through more video within the, uh, the iBook itself, what happens during a launch. We kind of explain all that information. Um, and then you, we have a series of projects that we have at the end that the kids can take uh, with them, uh, in, and I'll play one of these videos very quickly. And For your first project, you'll need three latex balloons, one meter stick, one box of but paper clips, this is, uh, one ball of string, basically the one pair of scissors, some of the scientific methods washers, that they can use. They can follow along. Them, they can actually get goggles. their uh, list of materials. After you receive your small safety medium, first, of large course, helium filled <laughs> balloon, um, and then you can go and you can recreate some of the activities as well. Um, and so the, the idea is just kind of getting this classroom stuff so they can take it home and learn with mom and dad as well. So I'm going to go back to the keynote here and finish this up. So that was the iBook. So uh, again, like I said, you can go to this website and you can see the materials. It's ilearn.bsu.edu forward slash tote, teaching on the edge. Tote just kind of worked out. I always find it's better if you can put an acronym in there. Uh, the iBook as well is available if you go to the Apple iBook store and you just search for Teaching on the Edge, it'll come up. It's the first one. It's free to download. And so, and you, so if uh, kids can get your kids and download the book and let us know how you, how you like it. So anyway, with that.
Yes, yeah, so are up. there any questions? Yes. I just wondered, um, have you guys talked with the PBS Learning Media folks at all? Um, have you ever heard of them? No. Yeah, so it's a really great um, group. So basically the idea is similar to what you're doing. They're basically trying to put all the PBS and, and as much other content as they can get on online for teachers to be able to use. And it's, it's typically like 30 seconds, you know, small right. tidbits, you know, mm -hmm. not to, like play a video during the whole class kind of thing. Right. But little tidbits to talk about all kinds of different things. And I know in our Montana PBS, um, they've been very interested to get a lot of our space kind of content um, up. Um, but every state has, you know, a particular mm -hmm. person or, you know, people who can upload content to the PBS Learning Media. And I just, if you're doing this fantastic thing, it would be great to, you know, share it with groups like that. that yeah. can Oh, it's a good idea. We had not uh, done that. We've been sending it out to the more technical libraries like the National Science Digital Library and places like that. But you're right, it's kid-friendly media, so a lot of it needs to get to where the kids would actually find it. Yeah. And I also, I, I, I don't want to uh, de-emphasize that, you know, this, a lot of this is geared towards the middle school student, but a lot of the materials on the website are geared towards college age, right. uh, actual uh, in-service teachers and, and pre-service teachers. So it's, it's, gear, it's, it's, it's a wide range audience. And, and that's always that weird little slippage, because I know we had some conversations when we started work on this with Don, is you, you sometimes say to yourself, how is creating middle school materials going to really help undergraduate science teachers in training? but they need curricular materials to walk into the classroom with. And something like this iBook can be a conversation starter between a uh, mentor on the Ball State faculty and a science student in training saying, how would you actually integrate the iBook? How would you use it? What would be the lesson plans, you know, and so forth. So there's a, so in a lot of ways, we're always looking at this in that broader, um, pedagogical field of not only, you know, do they have the materials, but I know people like Melissa are really working with how to, you know, assess the learning outcomes around all this as well, um, because that's the tricky part as well. You can even have an incredibly successful balloon launch, but then the trickier question if one of the goals is to uh, generate the next generation of scientists and engineers is, how can we begin to prove that the transference of knowledge actually happened in that 11 to 13 year old learner? Yes. Are these pre-service or in-service middle school <coughs> teaching students being trained to use the balloon? Yes. yes. Or are they expected to have some person show up and help them with <laughs> Well, well actually, actually both. Uh, they are learning the how to launch these balloons, but they're also doing it with some people to help them out as well. Um, one of one of your own, actually, who was featured in the video, is uh, Jeff Daly. He's done some of the. It, it, but here, here's where I'm going. I mean, yeah. they're going to go back to their middle schools. Presumably, and get mm -hmm. a job at a middle school, but Jeff Daly isn't going to be available. right. That's why we provide resources to all of those type of things on the website, so they can actually go and find somebody regional who can help them. We put all those yeah. on the list. And, and and just like with other resources, um, you know, and it, we'll, you know, we got to probably wrap up right now. But you know, there there was a talk at uh, your conference last year about you know. A service like Stratastar or Nearspace uh, Inc. And there are services now. So on the website, teachers who want to do this, we give them full contact information and what to expect if they actually try to do a genuine launch. Now, it's granted, it's not the same as someone walking them through it, but we really wanted there to be a uh, at least instructions, uh, something as similar to like a WikiHow, and if they wanted to really do it, a motivated middle school teacher should be able, from visiting Teaching on the Edge, to conduct a physical balloon launch with enough planning and uh, preparation. Right, and we make it very clear that there is cost involved with launching a balloon. I mean, it's the resources might be free, and that's a great word to get something through a, a especially at a. Uh, and a middle school that may be strapped for money, but we do make it aware that, you know, if you want to launch these yourself, there are costs involved, but we also put in uh, 
um, links to places you can <coughs> grants as well.